In this episode of Body Story, we unravel the mysteries of the two most important organs of the human body, the brain and the heart. And as we understand how these organs work, we also see how fragile they are and how easily they're affected by the chemicals we drink and eat. John Palmer's diet is high in cholesterol, and that means danger for the tiny arteries that feed blood to his heart. Fatty growths are blocking the passing flow of blood cells. It's still VF, charging 200. Thank you, everyone. Today, that is going to lead to disaster. Jeez. The alcohol that Greg Moore drinks floods into the gaps between his brain cells. It interferes with electrical signals that flash through his brain. And this has an instant effect, repressing the rational part of his brain, giving the animal within Greg a chance to enjoy itself. Greg's night is only just beginning. <laughs> the whole lot, just get them off as quick as you can. It's falling off, John. The wood they use is completely useless. Well, that's why they brought us in. Do the job properly this time. John Palmer's having a bad day. It's going to get much worse. That wall's in the wrong place. We'll have to take it down and start again. Be right down. Okay. You take care up there, Marcos. For 45 years, John's heart hasn't missed a single beat. But today, it's going to let him down, with dire consequences for his entire body. A ball of muscle no bigger than his fist, John's heart pumps enough blood to fill 40 barrels each day. Inside its chambers, red blood cells saturated with oxygen are sucked in and pumped out with amazing force. They are propelled into a network of blood vessels 75,000 miles long, which supplies oxygen to every organ and muscle in John's body. few problems. They're a hopeless lot they let loose on this place, you know. John's heart doesn't just supply oxygen to other organs. It also supplies itself. Clinging to its surface are narrow blood vessels, coronary arteries, which feed the heart's own muscular walls. The walls of John's heart consist of 50 million elastic muscle cells, all contracting together. This is the beat of John's heart. Yeah, we'll get it done. I'll just have to keep getting my hands dirty, that's all. Yeah, see you later. Bye. John, when you got a moment? Yes. Unluckily for John, Lurking inside one of his vital coronary arteries is a tiny time bomb. A growth no bigger than a grain of sand. It has the potential to alter the course of John's life. There you go. Ah, uh, just a job. Came free with our order. <laughs> Looks a bit like Kenny, don't you think? <laughs> Right. 
The growth inside John's coronary yeah. artery consists mainly of cholesterol. Yeah, I'm listening. Our bodies need cholesterol to function normally. Yeah. But most of what we require is manufactured in our livers. Why? Yeah. John doesn't need the extra cholesterol in his food. The surplus seeps into his bloodstream. Small amounts can be transported safely, but too much and it spills out, polluting his blood with globules of free-floating fat. Yeah, well, we all have days like that, don't we? Yeah, go on then. Cholesterol globules sink into tiny cracks in John's artery wall, creating a fat-filled growth, a plaque. Over the years, it bulges up and out into the artery. Slowly but surely, it begins to reduce the free flow of John's blood. Why? All of us have some plaques in our arteries, but John yeah. has many more than most men his age. Is it on the lorry? Is it on the lorry? The inner walls of his coronary arteries are riddled with plaques. Blood is being squeezed through vessels which are half the width they ought to be. 45 years of cholesterol buildup lurks beneath a thin and fragile membrane. It can't be delivered till when? Go on. John is suffering from advanced heart disease, but he doesn't know it yet, because so far his heart has been able to compensate for the damage. Well, I'll just have to manage, won't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll see <sighs> Only a week ago, a patch of his heart muscle became starved of oxygen. The gray muscle cells sent a distress signal to nearby coronary arteries. New blood vessels began to grow, a natural heart bypass bringing a fresh supply of oxygen to the starving cells. But this kind of bypass takes at least two days to grow, too slow to save John if an artery were to block suddenly. If anything else goes wrong today, Pete, give us a cigarette, will you? <laughs> give us a light one. John's heart is designed to respond to the needs of his body moment by moment. While he's sitting still, it needs to beat no more than 70 times a minute. To maintain its precision, it uses electricity. The heart is the only organ with its own power supply. A natural pacemaker very deep in its walls generates electrical pulses which ensure its regular beat. Each pulse surges through the cells which make up the heart's muscular walls, forcing them to beat in unison and keep perfect time. Let's be having you then. What kind of lunch break's that? What are you getting, mate? We've got another job to get to after this, you know? Another 10 minutes. Hey, get the ball against that wall. The whole lot will probably fall down by itself. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes left. Come in, come in, come on. Oh, oh, on, 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 on. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, come on, the ball there. Give it to me, come on. Give it back to me. As John chases after the ball, 70 heartbeats per minute is no longer enough to meet his body's demand for oxygen. It's a long time since he did any exercise, and his leg muscles cry out for extra fuel. His brain sends an urgent signal to his heart. The pacemaker reacts instantly, 
stepping up the rate at which it fires electrical pulses. Two minutes into the game, John's heartbeat has almost doubled to 120 beats per minute. Even though he's the slowest player on the field, his heart is beating faster than anyone else's. John's oxygen intake also adapts to his needs. He breathes faster and more deeply to supply his hungry muscles. He's taking in nearly 20 times more air than normal. Yes, I'm back. Come on, come to now. His heart keeps up its frenetic beat to pump this extra fuel to his legs. Simply to keep him in the game, John's heart and lungs are working at their limit. But by doing so, they're placing him in mortal danger. Blood is being forced faster and faster through his diseased coronary arteries. Flowing at five times their normal speed, blood cells eddy and swirl around his plaques. Bombarded by red blood cells, one fragile plaque is under unbearable strain. Its thin membrane is ripped open. Within moments, blood cells start to clot around the rupture. Anywhere else in John's body, this clotting response might save his life. But here, in his narrow artery, the effect is quite the opposite. The clot in John's artery traps more and more passing blood cells. It grows bigger, and the flow of blood to John's heart slows down. Downstream, the heart muscle cells are in peril. Their oxygen supply is dwindling just when they need it most. His starving cells send pain signals to his brain. But John has never experienced pain from his heart before. To him, it feels just like indigestion. He has no idea that this is the start of a heart attack. The growing clot is now blocking two-thirds of his artery. John's indigestion is getting worse. He feels a vice-like pain in his left arm. His brain is confused, overloaded with the escalating pain signals coming from his heart. For the first time in his life, the regular beat of John's heart is under threat. A patch of four million muscle cells is running low on oxygen. John, what's up? What's the matter? Five minutes after his heart attack began, John's body is struggling to deal with the crisis. His brain has triggered a surge of the hormone adrenaline into his bloodstream. This is one of the most primitive and powerful reactions in the human body. Adrenaline arrives in his heart and soaks into its inner walls. The pacemaker begins to accelerate. 
John's heart is racing at 140 beats per minute, even faster than when he was running around. But now all its efforts are focused on its own starving muscle. Call an ambulance. But adrenaline can do nothing about the growing clot, which fills 90% of his artery. The supply of oxygen to his heart cells is down to a trickle. They are forced to shut down the function which absorbs most of their energy. They stop beating. Leaving the rest of his heart to take up the slack. John's weakened heart cannot sustain its beat much longer. We're just playing a game of football. How's the pain now, John? Okay. He loves football, John. It's now 15 minutes since his heart attack began. And the flow of blood through John's artery is almost totally blocked. The heart muscle cells no longer have the energy to hold themselves in one piece. Their thin membranes are starting to leak. You're gonna be okay, John. Just hang on in there. John's injured heart is wearing itself out. Its beat is getting weaker. The effects are beginning to tell on the rest of his body. John is struggling to breathe because his lungs are filling with fluid. As his heart weakens, blood backs up in the vessels coming from his lungs. The extra pressure forces liquid out of his blood into the air sacs of his lungs. process doesn't stop, he could drown in his own body fluid. Uh, 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 uh. You must keep this on. Nice steady breaths now. Well done, mate. Bringing in a 45 year old male, possible MI, ETA three minutes, over. Just hold on, John. We're nearly there. They'll sort you out. The lack of oxygen in John's body is beginning to affect his brain. He's dizzy and disoriented. Time is running out for John. His starved heart muscle cells are beginning to burst and die. Let's get into his oxygen camp, If he's not treated within the next 20 minutes, his heart will be so badly damaged it will never beat normally again. What's the story? John Palmer, 45 year old. Collapsed with chest pains playing football. No past history, be hypertensive. BP 90 over 50, tachycardia 120. When did your pain start, John? I don't know. They said about half an hour ago. Don't worry, John. We'll soon have you sorted out. Are you his friend? Yeah. Do you know if he's got a heart problem? Can you give his details to reception? Right, let's do a 12 lead quick as you can, please. Okay, one, two, three. John is losing 500 heart cells each second. And unlike most cells in his body, they can never be replaced. He's got a big anterior MI, we have to thrombolize him. No contraindications, so let's give him some TPA. By measuring the pattern of electricity in John's heart, the ECG locates the dying patch of muscle. Now his only hope is that his blocked artery can be cleared by a clot-busting drug, tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA.
The TPA must reach the clot before so many heart cells die that his heart stops and he dies too. John's heart muscle has been reconnected just in time. Susie, hi, customer for you. Only Can half you a million John cells have been lost. Bacteria. The survivors are starting to beat once more. Okay. His condition yeah. has stabilized. Can you have a bed ready about 10 minutes? But as oxygen floods back, one surviving cell starts to beat out of step. It's generating its own electrical signal. This single cell with its different beat throws John's heart into chaos. Its signal clashes with the pacemakers. Electrical anarchy breaks out. Without a unifying pulse, his heart is unable to beat. It is in VF, ventricular fibrillation. His brain's oxygen supply drops to nothing. Unless John's heart is made to beat again in the next four minutes, his brain will be permanently damaged. Shopping, 200 Jews. Stand clear, please. The shock is 130,000 watts, enough power to light a football stadium. It's not designed to start John's heart. Instead, it stops it dead to give the pacemaker a chance to take back control. Shit, it's still VF. Charging 200. Thank you, everyone. OK, thank you, everybody. Let's get him up to see you quickly. It's, it's all right, right John. John. You've, You've done, done really well. Your heart went into a funny rhythm, John, but you're going to be OK. OK? Over the next five days, the ruptured membrane of John's plaque will heal. During that time, he'll be given drugs to stop a new clot from forming. But the plaque will always remain in his artery. There's damp coming through that wall, look. Relax, will ya? You're beginning to sound like Kenny. Forget about work. And you better forget about the football, too. Here you go. Oh. Oh. On the line. Oh, oh boy! <laughs> John has had a lucky escape. For the rest of his life, he'll take blood thinning drugs to prevent his arteries from blocking again. On his heart, the half million cells that died have left a scar. A permanent reminder of the trauma it has suffered. Get into the neck, come on! No! This is incredible! This is disastrous! We're managed to take In ages past, the heart was considered to be the seat of all our emotions, including love and lust. 
Now we know that when it comes to matters of the heart, it's the brain that actually matters. And Greg Moore's brain matter is a perfect case study. Greg Moore is a man with two brains. Beneath his highly evolved and rational brain lurks a more primitive animal brain. Greg, great news about the promotion. Oh, cheers. Good Tonight, service. it's going to get the better of it. Up the accounts manager. Okay, He's so a bit of an operator. Sorry, I've got to go. Hi, Laura. Have you finished work for the day, then? Did you hear about my good news? Your promotion? Yeah, congratulations. All right, thanks. I'm going for a drink later to celebrate with a few friends. Sounds like you deserve it. What? A drink. <laughs> All right. Most of the time, Greg's behavior is controlled by his higher, rational brain. But certain sights or sounds can trigger his animal brain to take over. From his ear, a signal flashes deep into his brain, to his limbic system, the part which has barely evolved beyond the brain of a lizard. The limbic system may be primitive, but without it, Greg would not survive. Millions of interconnected brain cells process a screeching sound signal and recognize danger. They fire signals down nerves into Greg's body. The hormone adrenaline is let loose in his bloodstream and spreads to every organ. In an instant, Greg's entire body is transformed. Without conscious thought, he saves himself. What are you, blind? You idiot, why don't you look where you're going? You don't just step up. The awesome power of Greg's limbic system is normally kept in check by his higher brain. No, you don't just step off the curb and walk in front of a vehicle, or you'll get yourself killed. Are you all right? But for a few moments, his rational brain has been sidelined. The beast within Greg is unleashed. So, can you come tonight? Well, I'm going to a party. But I might come to a drink first. Oh, Laura, I adore you. You're my little, little Laura. The conflict between primitive brain and higher brain is a fundamental part of human nature. The folded matter of Greg's higher brain, his cerebral cortex, makes him a civilized, intelligent being. Burning below is his limbic system, harboring his primal drives. But although the primitive brain only takes over in moments of crisis, it's in constant control of the basic functions of Greg's body. Day and night, it triggers the release of waves of hormones into his bloodstream. One of these is testosterone. It spreads everywhere and has effects all over his body. When it reaches the pores in his skin, it triggers hair growth. The more testosterone there is in his blood, the more often he needs to shave. Without testosterone, Greg would have no sex drive. Today, because of his promotion, his levels are particularly high. The hairs on his face are a little longer than normal. Ouch. Greg's primitive brain influences his behavior in subtle ways. His higher brain may link the note with the idea of food, but that thought triggers something deeper in his animal brain. To survive, Greg needs to eat. To make sure he does, his brain connects the thought of food with the promise of pleasure.
The act of chewing and swallowing triggers the release of a chemical called dopamine in Greg's limbic system. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, a chemical that is pumped across the gaps between brain cells, enabling electrical signals to travel from one cell to another and onwards through the brain. No one knows exactly how, but the dopamine stimulates pleasure pathways in the brain. It gives Greg a chemical high. Whenever we eat or have sex or do anything else to further our survival, our brains reward us with dopamine. It's our brain's way of making sure we survive. But these survival drives can be easily hijacked. Because the brain runs on chemicals, we can fool it did, using did, chemicals. He <laughs> All he said was, I have what it takes. I ain't selling. We gotta go straight in for the kill. I'm a shark. Alcohol passes into Greg's bloodstream from his stomach almost instantly. His blood circulates it around his entire body. Extra thick blood vessel walls protect his brain from most toxins in the blood. But alcohol molecules are so tiny that they slip through with ease. Just seconds after taking a sip, alcohol is floating through the fluid of Greg's brain. They even gave me this, look. Ooh. State of the art. Nice. Today's my lucky day. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Somehow, alcohol stimulates the brain to release dopamine. Every other addictive drug has the same effect. And if Lord turns up, I'm gonna play it cool. Well, you're not going straight Greg is getting a chemical high without doing anything to further his survival. <laughs> All right, do you girls want a drink? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Greg is hooked on dopamine. Please, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And he's just seen an opportunity for another hit. Another survival drive is kicking in. The drive to reproduce. Laura. Hi. You made it then? Mm. Had to dodge a few taxis to get here. <laughs> Yeah, I like your dress. It's very nice. It goes well with your eyes. Yeah, I think it's a bit revealing, do you? No. Just as in his encounter with the taxi, Greg's limbic system is taking over his body again. But this time, the trigger isn't danger. It's desire. The primitive brain has only one way of shifting Greg's body up a gear. Again, his heart begins to race. And adrenaline surges through his bloodstream. His body may be reacting the same way, but he reads the signals differently. Now he's not scared, he's aroused. You cut yourself, Shane. It's okay. The capillaries beneath the skin of Greg's face are swelling, bringing more blood to the surface. My is a bit blunt. By making Greg blush, his animal brain is telling Laura that he's sexually aroused. But his higher brain is trying to be cool. Yeah. Hmm. You should see my legs. They're torn to shreds. The conflict between his two brains is making him anxious. Oh, I've got to go. That party I told you about. Come if you want. Yeah. Um, well, maybe later. Where is it? Hang on. Greg's higher brain is just about keeping him in check. For now.
two bottles of beer later, inside Greg's skull, the balance of power is changing. Like a sponge, his brain is soaking up alcohol, and alcohol switches brain cells off. At the point where the electrical signals pass from one cell to another, alcohol molecules dissolve into the cell membrane and start to block the signals. The cell can no longer transmit messages through his brain. The effects of alcohol are felt in all parts of Greg's brain, but it hits first in his elaborate cerebral cortex. With his higher rational brain muted, his lower animal brain is free to take control. Thousands of years of evolution are dissolved in a few bottles of beer. two other parties. Yeah. Should we dance? As Greg sees another chance to reproduce, his primitive brain commands his body to produce sweat. His two and a half million sweat glands can make up to five pints of sweat in an hour. Sweating is mainly designed to cool Greg down, but it has another sexual role. Deep inside the pores in his armpit, testosterone is being converted into a chemical called androsterone and carried by sweat to the surface. Tiny bacteria which live on Greg's skin feast on the androsterone. The waste product of their meal is a strong scent. This scent may be the human equivalent of pheromones, powerful chemicals which trigger mating behavior in other animals. Laura too is giving off a scent which has a powerful effect on Greg. In the roof of his nostril is the only part of his brain exposed to the outside world. As scent molecules waft in, they strike nerve endings, sending signals straight into Greg's primitive brain. Unlike all our other senses, smell shortcuts the higher brain and plugs directly into the limbic system. This is why smells can inflame the unconscious animal drives independent of our rational minds. Greg's biggest sex organ is his brain. Alcohol may be blocking signals in his higher brain, but the pleasure pathways in his primitive brain can still be activated with dopamine. Greg's limbic system is rewarding him for trying to promote the survival of his genes. Ten percent of the area in his brain, which interprets touch, is linked to the nerves in his lips. <laughs> when he and Laura kiss, 
she is effectively stimulating one tenth of his body at once. Greg's animal brain directs more and more blood to the surface of his skin. Engorged with blood, his skin gets hotter by several degrees. The touch receptors in his skin become more sensitive to Laura's kisses and caresses. His quest for pleasure is about to be satisfied. <laughs> My place is five minutes away. Oh, no. St. Francis Street. OK, I've just got to go to the bathroom first. I'll wait for you outside. You are a shark. Oh, Laura, I adore you. Greg now faces a different kind of crisis, one that requires his higher brain. But just when he needs it most, it's been stifled by alcohol. Oh, no. Oh, his primitive brain is left to work out what to do. And its solutions are never subtle. Adrenaline diverts blood towards Greg's muscles, maximizing Hello? their strength. Hello? He's ready for a fight. Can somebody open the door? Sustained aggression demands energy. So adrenaline also liberates stored supplies of sugar to keep his muscles going. With the prospect of pleasure snatched away, Craig goes in search of dopamine again. But his only source is more alcohol. Hello? Yeah. Do you know where St. Francis Street is, please? Nah, mate. Yeah, do you know where St. Francis Street is at all? No. Excuse me, do you know where St. Francis Street is, please? No, sorry. In the past four hours, Greg has drunk the equivalent of eight bottles of beer. His liver works hard to break down the alcohol. And this disrupts other little functions, including the control of his blood sugar levels. Greg feels desperately hungry. Pizza. Let's get a pizza. Gotta get a pizza. Come on, I must eat some pizza, come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hello, yeah. Can, can I order a, a pizza that you can deliver, please? Yeah, hello? Hello, excuse me. Hello. Yeah, do you know, uh, do you know where St. Francis Street is? Not at all. All right, cheers. Greg? Excellent, man. Cheers. Superb. Half an hour later, Greg has consumed the equivalent of four more bottles of beer. He's drinking it eight times faster than his liver can get rid of it. His higher brain gave up on him hours ago. Now even his primitive brain is starting to shut down.
As his limbic system falters, his brain is unable to control the most basic bodily functions. Too much water is passing from his blood into his bladder. No matter how much he drinks, his body passes more. He's getting dehydrated. Greg has now consumed the equivalent of 14 bottles of beer. Alcohol has reached the base of his brain. Here it starts to sedate his cerebellum, the part of the brain which has kept humans upright ever since we first stood up on two legs. Luckily for Greg, the alcohol in his spinal cord has switched off many of the nerves which feed pain signals to his brain. If it weren't for its dangerous side effects, alcohol would be the perfect anesthetic. Greg's brain is now saturated with alcohol. Barely any signals pass through his brain cells. But he's lucky this time. A drinking binge like this is dangerous, sometimes even deadly. And if Greg were to do this more often, he would certainly cause his brain permanent damage. Greg's hangover has many causes. The fluid lost from his system has left his brain dehydrated. His blood is full of toxins produced by his liver as it breaks down the alcohol. His higher brain has started to function again, and it's just beginning to appreciate what his primitive brain drove him to last night. What are you doing here? Oh. Did you follow me home? No. No, I was, I was trying. Yeah. I got you these. So you remember us kissing? Yeah, of course. And you don't regret it? No. You look like you could do with a coffee. You better come inside. 